This lecture series is about surfaces. A surface is a topological space which is housed off, has a countable basis, and such that every point has a neighbourhood homeomorphic to the plane. Usually we're going to be paying attention to surfaces which are oriented and connected. Usually when mathematicians talk about surfaces, they mean those of finite type. A surface is of finite type if it's homotopic to a finite complex. For example, the sphere, the torus, a genus two surface, the plane, or a thrice punctured sphere. We sometimes consider surfaces with boundary. This means we allow some points to have neighborhoods modeled on a half plane, a product of R with a half line. If a surface S has boundary, then we define the double to be the surface obtained by taking two copies and identifying them together along their common boundary. We say that a surface with boundaries of finite type, if its double is, notice that this is not the same as saying it's homotopic to a finite complex. An example to consider is a closed disk minus a Cantor subset of its boundary circle. This is homotopic to a point, but we don't consider this to be of finite type. The double is a sphere minus a Cantor set, which is not homotopic to a finite complex. Here are some examples of surfaces of infinite type. The latter has infinite genus and two ends, and looks like an infinite cyclic cover of a genus two closed surface. The flute surface has genus zero and countably many ends converging to a single accumulation point at infinity. It looks like the plane minus the integers. The Loch Ness monster has infinite genus and one end. A sphere minus a Cantor set has infinitely many ends, one for each point in the Cantor set. And there's another surface, let's call it B, which also has a Cantor set of ends, but each one of these ends is an accumulation point of infinitely many handles. This surface is sometimes called the blooming Cantor tree surface. Here are some more surfaces of infinite type. The lattice surface is doubly periodic, and the jungle gym is triply periodic. Both of them have infinite genus and one end. And here's another picture of the Loch Ness Monster, where the end has been stretched out horizontally. So that becomes the end of the horizontal plane. In fact, these three surfaces are all homeomorphic. See if you can figure out why. Every surface, finite type or not, can be triangulated by a theorem of Rather. And any two triangulations of a surface are piecewise linear equivalent, meaning that they have common subdivisions, which are isotopic. It's not so hard to show that this is equivalent to the statement that every surface admits a smooth structure, and any two smooth structures on the same surface are diffeomorphic. One way to prove this is by handle straightening. Handle straightening says the following. Supposing we have a smooth surface S, and supposing we have an I handle in S. This means a map from the closed I dimensional disk times R to the two minus I into S, that's the I handle, which is an embedding. And we suppose that H is smooth on a neighborhood, let's call the neighborhood U, of the boundary of the closed disk times R two minus I. Then handle straightening says we can replace H by a new map H prime, also an embedding, with the same image, so that H prime agrees with H on this neighborhood U, and furthermore, H and H prime agree outside a compact set. And finally, H prime is smooth on a neighborhood of DI times zero.
Let's prove that every surface S has a smooth structure using handle straightening. First of all, because S is a surface, it's paracompact, and every point has a neighborhood which is homeomorphic to R2. This means we can find a countable collection of homeomorphisms, HI, from the plane into S, such that S is equal to the union of their images. Let's let UN be the union of the first N of these patches. What we're going to do is to inductively construct smooth structures on these UN so that when we construct the smooth structure on UN, it extends the structure on UN minus 1 that we've built so far. And one by one, we're going to modify the maps HI as we're defining these smooth structures in such a way that the map HI from R2 to UN is smooth for, U, for I less than or equal to N. Once we've done this, we will have built a smooth structure on all of the HI of R2, which is to say on all of S. Let W be the inverse of UN minus 1 under the map HN. What we're going to do is modify the map HN restricted to W, keeping it fixed on the complement of W, so that the result is smooth and has the same image. Triangulate W with triangles whose diameter goes to zero as we head out to the frontier of W. Now we use handle straightening in the following manner. We straighten the map HN on the triangles of W, handle by handle, first in a neighborhood of the vertices, then in a neighborhood of the edges, and finally we extend it over each of the triangles. The resulting map is smooth on all of W, so that it, this smooth structure that HN pushes from R2 onto S agrees with the smooth structure on UN minus 1 and extends it to UN. This is the induction step and includes the proof that every surface S has a smooth structure. Of course, we still have to prove the handle straightening proposition. Let's prove the case I equals zero. Actually, this is a hard case. We have a homeomorphism H from R2 to a subset of a smooth surface S. And we need to modify it where the modification is compactly supported in such a way that the result has the same image and the map is smooth somewhere on some neighborhood of a point, on some small ball. So let's take two smooth concentric balls, D contained in E in the image, and let's let X contained in Y be their pre-image under H. So X and Y are a pair of nested closed balls in R2, but they're not necessarily smooth. On the other hand, by the jordan schoenflies theorem, we can show that the region in between X and Y is homeomorphic to the region in between a smooth disk F and Y. And we can find a homeomorphism G from y to itself, taking the smooth disk F onto the not necessarily smooth disk X. And the composition of G with H extends by the map H outside of Y to give a map from R2 to S, which agrees with H outside a compact set, and which takes the smooth disk F to the smooth disk D. Now, we're not quite finished. The map from F to D is a map from a smooth ball to a smooth ball, but we don't know that the map itself is smooth. It's just a homeomorphism. On the other hand, the map on the boundaries, well, that's a homeomorphism between smooth circles, and so any such map is isotopic, actually, by a straight-line homotopy to a diffeomorphism. So we can insert this isotopy in a collar neighborhood of the boundary of F, 
on the interior and extend it smoothly over the rest of F so that the resulting map extends the map G on the complement of F, which then extends H on the complement of Y. And in the interior of F, well, it's not necessarily smooth at the boundary, but it's smooth outside a collar neighborhood of the boundary. So it's smooth somewhere. That concludes the proof of handle straightening in the case of a zero handle. The other two cases are similar, but actually a little bit easier. Putting this together, we get the proof of Rado's theorem, at least in the smooth category. Now let's talk about the classification of surfaces. The theorem is due to Caracciato. First of all, we need to talk about ends of a surface. The definition makes sense for lots of different kinds of topological spaces. But anyway, if S is a surface, we can define the ends of the surface in the following way. Let's take an exhaustion by compact subsurfaces S sub i. For each surface S sub i, you can remove it from S and look at pi zero of what's left over. An inclusion of S i into S i plus one induces an inclusion of S minus S i plus one into S minus S i. So there's a map on pi zero in the opposite direction, and we get an inverse limit of maps on pi zero. Since the surfaces SI are compact, pi zero of the complement has finitely many components, at least if we're assuming the surface S was connected to start off with. And therefore, the inverse limit is an inverse limit of families of finite sets, and is therefore a compact, totally disconnected topological space that we call the space of ends of S. Since it's compact and totally disconnected, it embeds in a Cantor set. There are two kinds of ends. There are the planar ends, those with the property that a neighborhood of that end in the surface is a planar surface, and those that are not planar, i.e. they're accumulated by genus. The non-planar ends we denote with a subscript, NP. The set of non-planar ends is a closed subset of the set of all ends. Notice that we can add the collection of ends of S to the surface S itself to make a compact topological space. The planar ends are exactly the surface points, the ordinary surface points, in S union at space of ends. The non-surface points are the non-planar ends. Now here's the statement of the classification theorem. And remember, we're still paying attention only to surfaces which are connected and orientable. If the genus is finite, then the surface is classified by the genus G and the space of ends up to homeomorphism. In other words, the set of ends thought of as a topological space, the homeomorphism type of it, together with the genus G, is a complete invariant of the surface S. If the genus is infinite, we have two kinds of ends. We have the planar ends and the non-planar ends. So we get a compact space E of ends and we get a compact subset of space, E sub NP, of non-planar ends, and both of them embed in the Cantor set. Then the surface S in the infinite genus case is classified by the homeomorphism type of the pair of spaces, E sub NP, contained in E. In other words, if you have two surfaces, S and S prime, both of infinite genus, and you have some kind of abstract homeomorphism from E of S to E of S prime, which takes the non-planar ends of S to the non-planar ends of S prime, then the surfaces are homeomorphic. 